Hello and welcome to yet another Coast Watch webinar. This one, Between the Grains with Marty Giles, was recorded on October 6th, 2022 and brought to you by Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition, founded in 1971 to protect the public interest in Oregon's beaches established by the Beach Bill. My name is Jesse Jones and I am the volunteer coordinator for Coast Watch, a mile-by-mile -mile beach adoption program. Marty Giles began interpreting the natural resources of the Oregon coast 50 years ago and has worked in many aspects of communicating about nature, from program delivery to teaching and supervising. Along the way, she earned a bachelor's degree in natural science and a master's degree in recreation with an emphasis on interpretation. She's the owner operator of Wavecrest Discoveries, a nature guiding service on the Southern Oregon coast. She also writes a monthly column for the world newspaper and does contract writing and editing. A lifelong Oregonian, she has lived in Oregon's Coos Bay area with her family for more than 30 years. So I thought sandy beaches were going to be boring. And I spent uh, that summer learning a little bit about sandy beaches. And I found they were absolutely astounding. And the sand itself is uh, something that I love talking about because everybody's familiar with sand. You're familiar with sand, right? You wash it off your hands, you combed it out of your hair, you've walked on it, you've shaken it out of your clothes. Um, but sand has some wonderful, marvelous stories. And we're gonna talk about some of those things today. Uh, we're also gonna talk about what sand does. It's not a real passive thing necessarily. And we are going to uh, do some exciting things uh, talking about sand. So, why are we talking about sand other than I find it interesting? Uh, we're talking about sand because about 60% of Oregon's coastline is sandy beach, okay? Of that, about 45% of our beaches have dunes, which are also sand. Uh, beaches can be gravel or cobble as well, cobble being smaller and of various sizes. Um, but if we say, and call a beach with gravel or cobble a beach, we put a modifier on it. We say that's a gravel beach or a cobble beach typically. So beaches are usually sand or at least movable material. If the shoreline does not have movable material, it's not a rocky beach, that, that's in a, inappropriate. <laughs> uh, it's a rocky shore. So we're talking about sand um, because it's a cool thing. It's not a thing. I set you up for that one. Sand is not a thing. Sand is a size. It's a certain very specific size. The lower uh, range of that size varies depending from place to place a little bit. And sometimes they carry it into five decimal points. It's just a little much for us, I think, but it's, it's a small size. If it's smaller than that, we call it silt. If it's larger than that, we call it gravel. And it's even bigger than gravel, we call it cobbles material that's been easy to move around. So sand is made of whatever's hard enough and easy to move around. Bits of shell, ground up coral skeletons, skeletons uh, of coral that have been eaten and pooped out, for example, uh, hard plankton cases. It can be made chemically, such as in, great, uh, in the Great Salt Lake. It can be man-made. Most sand are rock fragments and mineral crystals, and most of the sand on the Oregon coast are rock fragments and mineral crystals. We do have biogenic sand. We'll talk about that a little bit. I'll show you a quick picture uh, a little later on. So rocks are made of crystals. Sometimes the crystals are too small to see. And the weak place in the rock is the space between the crystals. So when rocks erode or are eroded by, by weathering, by changes in temperature, by water getting in cracks and freezing and wedging them open, by plants and other things getting into the cracks and breaking the crystals apart, they are broken down into different sized sediments and that range of sediments we call sand. And the sand is easily moved. So it is moved down streams and rivers. Uh, when rocks are broken apart, they may be broken into sand and silt, as well as uh, gravel and cobbles. Much of the gravel and cobbles uh, get caught along the way on the streams and rivers, and the silt is often uh, suspended in the water until it gets out into the ocean. So sand that we think of is the size that shows up, that travels well, uh, doesn't tend to get caught too much and shows up on the shoreline. 
On the upper left-hand corner here is a, um, Jesse, can you see my mouse moving around? Yes, I can, yes. Okay. I did, we did not test that before. Uh, so this is the range of grains that are sand range to show you how big it is. Sand also, uh, crystals are almost always sharp-sided or flat-sided. And as they move, they get smoothed off, little points get cut off and uh, the, they get rounded off. So sand is, is also um, divided into class by how rounded it is. And groups of sand um, is also identified by how well sorted it is. So some places like the Oregon dune sand is really well sorted. And there are places like Bandon where it's really poorly sorted. Uh, and there are lots of big pieces of, of um, crystals of sand mixed in with the smaller ones. This is what some of our sand looks up close. This happens to be a, um, uh, a sample of sand from Sunset Bay. Um, and all, by the way, all the photographs here are mine, unless if they're not mine, they're identified in, uh, in the lower left-hand corner by the author. And Rex Elliott, I sent him some sand samples years ago and he had the kindness to send me these lovely photo micrographs. No, I do not know the scale. But this is regular sand that you would find on most beaches. It's uh, real common. The minerals that you see here uh, are quartz, three grains of quartz. The beige or feldspar, green minerals are olivine and epidote. There's some pink uh, garnet on most of Oregon's beaches. And individual beaches will have different proportions of minerals and different minerals in many cases. Uh, they are, uh, it's surprising both how diverse our sands are and how um, uniform they are in some places. So this is Oregon coast, the sample of Oregon coast sand. So you can clearly see that they're about the same size because they've been um, kind of sorted out in the travel to get to the coast. Um, they are clearly different colors and they're also clearly different hardness. The quartz are really hard. They keep their flat sides and sharp points a long time. And the feldspar is soft. It gets rounded off pretty quickly. In fact, if you took this and, and ran it down the Mississippi, the feldspar would probably completely disappear. The quartz would be more rounded when it got to the Gulf, but it would look different after it's been worn away a little bit. The sand varies by another physical property as well. So if you took, like I did the, uh, about two weeks ago, if you took uh, a magnet, and you dropped it in on the sand, on dry sand, on almost any Oregon beach, you will have this happen. Some of the black grains, not on every beach, but most beaches have some black magnetite, convenient name for the black mineral, uh, that has enough iron to stick to a magnet. You know a lot about iron, you know it sticks to a magnet. You know if you have something made out of iron, like a bicycle, um, and you leave it out in the rain, it will rust. And many uh, sandstone cliffs along the Oregon coast, some places will have rusty cliffs because the magnetite is oxidizing. And you know, if you have something made out of iron like a hammer and you hold it in your hand, you'll find it heavy, right? So interestingly, by and large, the lighter colored grains are lighter weight and the darker grains are heavier. So you can see places, and you probably have already seen places on the Oregon coast where the sand grains have been sorted out by weight and we see them as variations in the color patterns on the beach. This particular shot was taken a long time ago uh, outside of Newport. This is a close up and you can see where the water where it was moving at different speeds, uh, moved different, uh, was able to move more or less of that, that range of sand weights. And so you have those really lovely patterns from very light to greenish is a greenish patch on this corner right here. Green and red is darker than the black, but lighter than, than the, the beige colors. And here's a nice stripe of black. In fact, if you see this, if you walk on the beach and you look at a place where it's doing this and the water's still moving, you can watch it braid itself. It's incredibly cool. Happens on the beach white as well. This is uh, Newport Beach, uh, probably about the same time, might be at, taken at the same time in the winter time. We'll talk about why the winter time, the beaches are darker here in a moment. So where does the sand come from? Hmm. 
The sand actually has a very checkered history. Um, this is what Oregon looks like now, sort of, on, at least on the map. And if you had been living here 300 million years ago, it would have been very different because then Oregon, instead of being halfway between the equator and the pole, uh, was then near the equator and it was turned up on this lower left hand, right, lower right hand corner here, more diamond shaped. And the blue section here was the edge of the North American continent, what became the North American continent. And offshore, there was a series of uh, volcanic islands, kind of like Japan is offshore China. Right? And there were sediments around these little red dots or represented by these little red dots. Um, and when we started moving to the West 300 million years ago, uh, we scrunched up this, over, this bottom. We scrunched it up in layers that get sequentially younger as you move toward, toward the beach. And we now call those scrunched up, uh, scrunched up area the Klamath Siskiyou Mountains. The youngest part of that system on this edge, on the coast edge, is about 180 million years old. And the northernmost part of it is at Bandon. This is why the southern Oregon coast looks so different from the rest of it, is because this metamorphic rock, all scrunched up stuff, volcanics and sandstone and, and different kinds of metamorphosed rocks, uh, all very irregular, um, do a good job of making offshore islands and stacks here on the Southern Oregon coast. So for probably over a hundred million years, the, the material here in the Klamath Siskiyous primarily, and some at the edge of the continent uh, eroded. And those grains were loosened up, the crystals were loosened up from the rocks and they settled out to the north. While we've been moving to the west, we still are, as you probably know, we're moving up about as fast as your fingernails grow. So we're that much closer to Japan every minute. And um, as we go this way, the ocean bottom is being pushed underneath and it gets pushed underneath, heated up, heats the bottom of the continent. And starting about 50 million years ago, some um, of that melted continent got pushed up and uh, we now call that the, the old Cascades or the low Cascades. All the material eroding from the Kalamas and from the Cascades settled out here uh, in this corner, this half of Oregon. Layer upon layer of sediment over time through temperature and pressure and chemistry made into layers of sandstone. Those started getting rumpled up about 40 million years ago. The rocks are older, but they were rumpled up about 40 million years ago. And we call that the Coast Range. Okay? Over our travels, um, there were cracks and each of these red dots, well, they're representational, um, are places where cracks in the continent allowed melted ocean bottom to creep up and uh, show up as volcanics in Eastern Oregon. I'm sorry, Eastern, the other direction, Western Oregon. Between about 25 and 60 million years ago, we had more of that happening. We call those the big volcanic peaks now, um, the, uh, the high cascades where those big mountains are. And then we had a lot of lava flowing down, creeping out and flowing out huge amounts in central and eastern Oregon and Washington, even flowing down the Columbia River, even flowing down the northern coast on the beach, cooking clams, just boiling down the beach, uh, really must have been a really spectacular thing um, between 25 and 60 million years ago. So that's on the long scale. All of these things have been um, contributing to the crystals that we now call the sand on the Oregon coast. And in fact, so you can think about this, that the grains that came here, that developed here in the Klamath, broken apart, went to the beach, went to the bottom of the ocean here offshore, were turned into rock, brought up again, broke apart again, and went to the beach again. Of course, the beach has changed quite a bit. And the, um, the shoreline has changed during the ice ages, of course, in the last 110,000 years or so. Uh, the sea level's been much higher than this and much lower than this. And while the Oregon coast now is for the most part, Rocky Headland, Sandy Cove Beach, Rocky Headland, Sandy Cove Beach, except for the Oregon Dunes right here. Um, whoops. 
don't click your mouse while you're playing with it there. Um, the Oregon coast uh, at the height of the ice ages looked a lot different. It looked like this. Uh, the, the, land, the line between uh, the beach line essentially was one or two long sandy beach. Here's Cape Blanco. And the processes that we're going to talk about here in a few minutes uh, occurred up and down the beach because these are long sandy beaches, not rocky headland sandy beach, rocky headland sandy beach, a very different kind of uh, situation. So when you go to the beach, you're walking on a combination of sand that came from um, that might be near shore rocks in some places like Sunset Bay, but other places have, especially like Cape Kiwanda notably and, and Hug Point have sandy uh, shorelines here. Uh, but a lot of the beach sand uh, is old beach sand from when the sea level was lower. It was pushed up as the sea levels rose and now is mixing with other things to make each beach a uni unique. Uh, each give each beach a unique sand. So the sand is moving around a lot. It's not just laying there, it's coming and going, it's moving around. We're gonna talk about those processes. Waves move the beach. Tides uh, affect the processes of the sand because they affect where the waves break. Wind, of course, is a major sand moving process. We're gonna talk about that more. Uh, climate affects the wind. We'll talk about that, touch on that. And ocean currents also affect how the sand is moved on the Oregon coast. So those of you who've gone swimming in the ocean, of course we don't do it here, it's too cold. But if you've been swimming in the ocean, you know that uh, the waves outside the breakers uh, don't move much water because waves, long ocean, shore, uh, long ocean swells, those ocean waves are vibrations made by storms, maybe thousands of miles away. And as the vibration comes in to the shore, and I'm sorry, as it moves, that water is actually moving in circles. Circles get smaller with depth. And when the wave gets close, as the bottom comes up and it gets close to shore, those waves start dragging and you watch the waves. You've seen them get steeper and steeper and then they break. And when they, they break differently on the shore, on the sand, depending upon the shapes of the waves, the length of the waves, and the shape of the bottom. So as a wave comes up and it breaks, the energy that made the vibration is released, and the wave will usually pick up sand or other loose material on the beach, pick them up, pick up the sand, and move it. So in the summertime, we get little waves, travel across the ocean, get shallow, they break, releases the energy from the storm that made the vibration, picks up some sand and pushes it on the beach. The next wave travel across the ocean, picks up some sand and pushes it on the beach. So by the end of summer, we had this big hump on the beach of sand. In the winter, we have bigger waves travel across the ocean, breaks, releases the energy, picks up some sand, pushes it on the beach. And then because it's a bigger wave, has energy left over and pulls the sand off the beach. So typically by the end of winter, the sand that's here on the face of the beach is pulled into offshore sandbars uh, under the water. And then the next summer, those are pushed back onto the beach. So the sand is going on the beach in the summer, off the beach in the winter. And that's why you find more agates in the winter time because in part, because the sand is taken off the beach exposing more gravel. And in the winter, when the sand is off the beach, winter storms have faster access, easier access to the, the cliff or the dune on the, on the uh, land side and will eat out more gravel and such. And frankly, in the winter, there's less competition for the agates. So that budget isn't exactly zero. When we have El Nino's, we have a slightly increased sea level. We have bigger waves. El Nino of 98, as many of you know, probably most of you know, uh, ate the shoreline, uh, took the sand, took more sand off the, the summer beach than usual. 
and exposed a lot of tree roots and old forests at the shore's edge. Nesquin is a famous example. Even Sunset Bay has just the roots of these uh, trees that were buried for 1200 years, exposed. That El Nino took the sand so far away in many of those places that um, previous or su subsequent storms haven't been able or summers haven't been able to push the sand back onto the beach. So on the beach in the summer, off the beach in the winter, uh, and that dynamics is what changes from year to year, not year to year, but through the year. The tides affect sand movement in that they affect where the waves are breaking, right? And so the waves will break higher on the beach at high tide, lower on the beach at low tide, and will affect the sand movement in that direction. The climate has a bigger effect on sand movement um, for a couple of reasons. One is we have what we have moderate temperatures that doesn't affect the sand much, but we have wet winters and dry summers, as you probably know. And so we have seasonal arid conditions. Uh, and that is one of the main reasons that we have dunes on the Oregon coast, such a large section of dunes. We have the largest dune sheet in North America on the Oregon coast because of the seasonal rainfall. When it's dry, it's, easy, it's easier for the wind to blow the sand. Um, the wind does blow the sand in the winter when it's wet, but it has to work harder at it. Uh, and so the sand is very mobile uh, in the summertime. We also have um, very different winds in winter and summer. Um, I think everybody here is familiar with the north wind in the summer. This is a wind chart that shows uh, the open circles on the left show the summer winds. The little spikes coming off those circles show the direction of the wind and the duration of time it comes from that direction for that location. The colored circles are uh, winter winds and look how different they are. Very different. North winds in the summer howl down out of the Arctic and keep us cool and dry. In the winter, the winds shift around about this time of year. They shift around to come up from the tropics to keep us warm and moist. That seasonal wind direction is a defining element of our dunes. Something weird about Brookings, my apologies to Brookings people here on the webinar today. There's something about the way the clam winds around the Klamaths work. They have weird climate at the southern end of the coast, but still a little bit different in the wind directions, summer and winter. So wind moves sand, right? Um, if the wind blows hard enough, it will pick up sand and move it quite a ways. I'm sure many of you have been on the coast when, especially if you go to the top of a high dune in July, mid afternoon, the sand can be windborne up to your armpits. Uh, if the wind is blowing just a little bit, it can roll sand grains, but in between, uh, sand grains can dance. The Latin derivative of the word, or the English derivative of the word for, uh, in Latin for to dance is saltation. And we have a video for you, set up a video for you of sand actually doing that. I think I just, I'm gonna do, yes, here we go. Nope, wrong one, here we go. Uh, this is a video of the dunes at Oceano uh, Dunes in uh, California. And it's a five minute video. Don't worry about it. I'm not gonna play the whole five minutes, but I wanted to show you, since it's so cool looking, what saltation looks like. So somebody had a nice uh, video that had a uh, high lens on it and we can watch it happening.
can actually see each grain being popped out. It lands, another grain will come. It doesn't just bounce, but it will land and another grain will pop it right out of the way, take its place maybe, but maybe pop it high enough that it will catch the wind and blow a little further. So it's not one grain necessarily bouncing, it's one grain bouncing and then knocking the next one out of place and into the air. So hopefully that was worth the few minutes. As the wind is moving the sand, it will uh, do a number of things. It will pile it up at the right speed in little places, little short pieces. It will, um, uh, that we call little ripples and we'll pile it up in big dunes uh, that we, big piles rather that we call dunes. As the wind blows, the wind will sort the sand as well by weight, just like the water does. And the sand um, can come up to the edge and will, you know, as, if you know from walking on the dunes, it's hard packed on this side, gets to the top and it crests over the brink and it sets up a slip base, the angle of repose, uh, the angle at which the sand um, steeper, the sand will tumble down uh, and so it will develop up to that size, that, that shot, that, excuse me, I'm getting. <laughs> so as it blows, it can make different layers in the sand, just like we, we looked at a minute ago. Hmm, there we go, oops. Nickel difficulties. In the little ripples, sometimes you can see here, for example, where, this, where the sand has been sorted out by weight. Uh, often on the high dunes, um, I don't was not able to locate a, a good picture, but often in the high dunes, the sand on the very top of the crest will be dark and below the crest will be lighter weight because the darker sand just has a little more trouble with the weight being pushed over, over the edge. But you can often see this color va variation uh, darker on the on the in the trough or darker in the, in the crest, depending upon this wind speed. Uh, when you look at the open sand uh, in the little, little ripples on the small scale, but also in the high dunes on large scale. Because wet sand sticks together, that's why you use wet sand to make sand castles. Uh, after the rains come in the winter and the dunes are wet and the wind shifts its direction uh, to the south, uh, it will carve into those wet dunes and make yardangs, freestanding uh, sand sculptures that will eventually and easily wear down over the course of the winter. So the sand is moving up and down the beach with the wind direction um, as the, it gets pushed off the beach uh, with, the, um, with the seasonal sand movement that we just talked about, dries out a little bit, the Northwest wind in the summer, we'll pick it up and push it inland a little bit and into the four dunes. And the four dunes are the edge of the Oregon dune system or the dune system. So we're gonna talk about that here for a couple of minutes. Uh, in, in our state here, the Oregon dunes are about uh, 40 miles long and a couple of miles wide, but it's not all the same kind of habitat, certainly. The sand is blown off the beach as I just described and nowadays gets caught in the foredoon. The wind runs through the plants of the foredoon, drop, slows down enough to drop the sand that's coming off the beach and is building up this foredoon. The wind continues obliquely inland from the north and from the west and digs a hole down to the water table, making a seasonal wetland called a deflation plain. Sand is continually moving. Some of it blows through the deflation plane, prehistorically uh, would blow through the deflation plane, uh, making five foot dunes we call transverse dunes. Those march through the landscape inland and in the summertime to the south and form these high dunes called oblique dunes because they move south in the summer and north in the winter. The dunes march, march across the landscape, uh, that, that, that marching uh, gives them an oblique, a rounded U shape. They march across the landscape and might spill into the woods. Uh, the sand covering up trees will kill them. Sometimes they'll march around a piece of forest that is growing on old dunes that have since been covered by plants. 
and then uh, covered up here and may make an, an island of forest in a sea of sand. Historically, this system was very dynamic and uh, there would be a, some places where the, the sand was stabilized enough for plants to grow and the forest to grow up. And then either the dunes would cover up the forest or there'd be a fire and the dunes would cover up the forest. Historically, the deflation plains came and went and moved quite a bit, would be covered up in one place and show up in another place. And all that has changed quite a bit. Nevertheless, you still have a huge variety of habitats uh, in the Oregon dunes. You can see that from the air, especially. So water currents uh, change with the seasons as well. In the summertime, when the wind is coming from the north, we have north winds that run along the shore. That's what drives the upwelling in the summer that makes the water colder in the summer than it is in the winter. In the winter, those, those uh, currents come up from shift direction like the wind does and come up from the south. So the water is also moving the sand north and south with the season. Sand is moving on and off the beach in the season, but also with each wave. And that trans, that change in current and change in wind means that it goes different directions, summer and winter. And so each season has a different current along the shore longshore current. So in the summertime, the sand is moving along shore and inland, but up that direction. In the winter, it switches around and moves up along that way. So that's why we have different kinds of erosion, especially at the mouths of rivers, different times of year, because that movement of sand is, can be drastically, is drastically different winter and summer. Sand doesn't have to stay on the beach. Sand can be pushed off the beach um, uh, through longshore transport by be running off the beach maybe and into deeper water where it escapes that, that those currents. It can also move off the beach where there are rip currents, not undertow, that's a different thing. A rip current is formed when water is piling up on the beach and you can't pile water on something. And so if it starts to pile like on an incoming tide with big waves coming in, breaking in, uh, it will look for a weak spot and then form a current that comes from the beach out to deeper water. And that's one of the other ways that sand can leave those processes um, and leave the beach. Again, that's why the current um, the currents change the erosion. And that's why when El Nino changes our our current patterns, we have profoundly different, we can have profoundly different erosion patterns on the sand on the shoreline. Headlands interrupt that, that uh, process and headlands tend to be a little bit self-perpetuating because as the waves come into shore and it gets shallow, they slow down where it's shallow and it's shallow off the end of a headland. So they tend to wrap around headlands and increase the erosion, which is why there's rarely beaches or doesn't tend to be as many beaches on the edges of headlands as there are between headlands. And that's the process that you see. If you watch a beach for a long time, you've noticed that the headlands erode, even though it doesn't seem like the beach changes all that much in between. They're eroding because the waves are wrapping around that and getting it on both sides at the same time. So there are places where those circles are being made on the Oregon coast of the sand moving on the beach in the summer and to the south and off the beach in the winter and to the north. Big circles are being made uh, of water swirling the sand around. We call those littoral cells. The huge sun here, the Ku cell is uh, where the dunes are. Uh, and actually there are little cells within that because that's a very large system to work. And think about this. What is it that is, let's think about a, a shallow bowl with sand of different weight being moved around in a circle. What's that remind you of? Panning for gold. The heavy sands show up on the northern sides of those circles. So each circle has some, not just different sand in different spots. One of the reasons they're different sands in different spots is because those cells are different. When the sea level was lower, I mentioned that there was um, 
uh, different shorelines that are Rocky Headland, Sandy Cove Beach, Rocky Headland, Sandy Cove Beach. The shore in Oregon was two, for the most part, two long sandy beaches. And the sand that came down the streams and rivers went right to the beach, moved up and down the shore because the same processes were at work, moved up and down the shore as the sea level and got all mixed up. As the sea level has been rising, it's been pushing the sand ahead of it. And now that sand is trapped between headlands. They found sand grains in Cannon Beach. They know came down the Umpqua River at Reedsport. They can identify the grains as coming from mountains that are the only place that those mountains are that, that rock source is, is um, up at the upper reaches of the Umpqua. And they now it's stuck at Cannon Beach because those headlands are in the way. So three sources of sand for whatever beach is your favorite beach. One is the ancient beach. So there are beaches that don't have much ancient beach, especially on the Southern Oregon coast. Most of them have some ancient beach, some have a lot. Uh, there's often some uh, small grains that have been eroded off the near shoreline that is added to that local beach. And sand on a particular place also comes down the local streams and rivers. So each beach, each place has unique sand. Three sands together that you may have seen somewhere. Uh, the Sunset Bay sand in the lower right hand corner. Bandon sand is different source. The rocks there are much older and the sand is poorly sorted. So it has a very different looking sand. Oregon dune sand again has been sorted uh, by weight and, and by, comp by size of grains and by composition because it's sorted by weight. So it's lighter and it's finer. All of these sands, by the way, are this sand, the dune sand is about an hour from, less than an hour from the abandoned sand drive time. So the, there is a group called the uh, uh, International Society of Sand Collectors. They meet as an international group, people from around the world, they meet someplace around the world every year. Uh, this year, the last month, they were in Charleston. And um, I wasn't able to go, unfortunately, but a friend of mine was able to go and, and gave me, uh, I was able to buy a copy of their, their um, materials, the really excellent pr proceedings from that meeting. And in there, one of the proceedings was guidebook for their field trip. And this is the page um, for some of the sands uh, on the Oregon coast. There were like four or five pages of this, of uh, sands on the Oregon coast. Uh, if you look at them, see they're hugely diverse. Uh, Otter Rock Marine Reserves on the central coast on the lower right-hand corner has a lot of uh, biogenic sand, a lot of pieces of, of dead animals. The sand is not a thing, but a side. Um, Middle Cove of Cape Arago has a lot of bits of shell. Some of these uh, Oregon dunes, very small grains, um, highly polished. Some Arizona beach uh, on the southern coast uh, near Hug Point um, it has really dark sand on it. So they have a really cool, um, cool thing happening because uh, they all collect sands. One of the events at, the, at that, that place is where everybody brings little baggies of sand with labels and they have a big trading session. And my friend, uh, Stephen Michael, uh, because I couldn't be there, walked through that with a couple of big baggies for me. And I just, ha I have to show you what the desk behind me looks like. These are all sands. <laughs> just, oh, this one's pretty, this one's pretty. And he just collected all these sands uh, from uh, around, mostly around the US. So, sand's pretty interesting, but what is it like to live in, okay? It has a diversity of challenges for living things. Uh, it's extremely dynamic. We've talked about some of the ways that it moves. It's abrasive, especially the raw sand, those sharp corners. If you've ever walked uh, barefoot, you've had in, uh, a stiff wind in the dry sand, you know, it'll, it'll just eat the dickens out of your ankles. It doesn't support. It's hard to walk in. It moves around. It's hard to uh, keep your place in. Uh, if you are a hard thing, uh, you might be exposed or you might be buried. It doesn't retain water well, so it dries out really quickly or it becomes completely soaked easily. Uh, at the shore, that means uh, sand is soaked by either fresh or salt water and a piece of sand um, beach could be soaked with fresh water when it's raining at low tide and be inundated with, with salt water. It's kind of like an estuary, only uh, maybe even more pronounced. 
Sand is poor in nutrients because it doesn't hold much. So it's a really challenging place to live. And it's sometimes mixed with other substrate. Uh, for rocky or tidal, having a sand, sandy beach come up and, and grind you away every summer is a major hazard. At the beach too, it's an edge habitat between the marine environment and the land environment. The dunes uh, are also an edge habitat between the beach, the wet beach, and the forest or the meadows. So the plants that are adapted here, you're gonna hear more about plants uh, adaptation on the 25th with Dr. Hacker's uh, program. Um, I'm just gonna to touch base uh, with a couple of these right now. Uh, many of the plants that survive in our sand environments are thick and fleshy, uh, like desert plants you'd expect to be. Uh, they store water. Uh, our, do, our sand plants are sometimes fuzzy. Uh, that helps protect them from being abraded. Many of our sand plants are viney because it's really hard to keep your place when the sand is moving. And uh, many of them have very deep roots um, that go quite deep. Sometimes the water is only a couple feet below, even high in the dune, but you got to go for it. And many of them combine deep roots and uh, fuzziness uh, to get more than one uh, benefit. European beach grass is really good at living in a sand environment. And we're going to talk about that here in just another moment. Oops, I'm going to talk about that now. <laughs> so European beach grass is, is well adapted, uh, especially well adapted for a really interesting reason. Uh, we have a native be uh, grass that grows in the sand. And here in this photograph, in the lower left-hand corner with broad blades, lives up and down the Oregon coast. Uh, this particular beach grass was, uh, also lives up and down the Oregon coast. It's introduced. There's a second introduced beach grass on the northern Oregon coast. Uh, this particular beach grass uh, has a cool adaptation in, in that instead of having flat blades, it has, um, the, the blades are curled around and the tough outer cuticle that's normally on the top of the leaf is curled around to protect the innards, the innards where the, uh, the more delicate part of the leaf, but also where it transpires. So it, keeps it keeps it from getting uh, scoured up by the sand and also from uh, drying out by the wind. Tough place for animals to live. Uh, in the dry sand, uh, you see a lot of marks uh, in the sand, especially about early in the morning. This, these are porcupine tracks. You see the, the quills. Uh, these are saw, fly, zigzag tracks, and mouse tracks. Um, it is really difficult to live in dry sand, and most of the animals that you see in dry sand are just passing through. Ciliated sand beetles are well adapted to living in moving sand. Look how furry they are. That helps move them move in the sand, and they're the ones that make these really cool tracks in the sand around some of the plants. Uh, that you may see along the shore. In the marine environment, uh, there's a lot of marine or organisms that can stand living in the sand. The two main adaptations for those that survive are to keep moving, to swim away, or to burrow. And they'll have to burrow up and down quite a bit in order to um, take, keep the right location for them. You can see the signs, you've all seen these, the signs of clams, for example. Uh, deep, any deeper than a couple millimeters, deeper than that as the water starts becoming, um, starts losing its oxygen. And so most of the bigger organisms that live in the sand have to have ready access and keep access to the surface so they can get the oxygen they need as well as the food that they need. So there's a, a little bit of a razor clam show and worms and shrimp and all sorts of invertebrates uh, burrow in the sand, but they have to reach the top of the sand uh, because it's so dense below that they're, uh, they, they can't reach what they need. This is not a sand flea, it's a mole crab that is adapted to living in the sand, but feeding above the sand, these little antenna come up and they sweep the water as the, the wave washes over them um, for plankton in the water. So the sand itself, as I mentioned, is, is, pretty, is pretty sterile by itself. Um, and the, the kelps and the other rack that washes up on shore, particularly with winter storm, is a boon is a mainstay of the food chain for a sandy beach. 
And in fact, in places in California, for example, where they might take the kelp and the seaweed off the beach because we think some people think it's kind of ucky, uh, that the populations of the organisms that live in the sand uh, drop dramatically. Organisms live in the sand, little tiny organisms. We see beach hoppers, for example, in the sand, feeding on the rack, the organic material. You've seen these. They're the ones that pop up and hop around, right? This is a California beach hopper. Those are pretty big. You can see them, like you can see the clam holes, the clam show, you can see wormholes and such. But the real wealth of animal life in sand is between the grains. So you can see if I pack these grains together, there would still be spaces between them. And there's huge numbers of uncountable numbers of organisms that make their life in between the grains of sand. They're called myofauna, meaning in between. There are scores of phyla. There's just unimaginable variety of organisms from uh, amoebas to tardigrades and, and full grown organisms and uh, little organisms, baby organisms, all uh, mixed up in the sand, hanging onto the grains or living between them. Some are pretty cool. There's a nematode, uh, kinkerinch, or never, there's a kinkerinch and a nematode, uh, ostracod, a kind of a, a, of a shelled organism, different kinds of worms, living in the wet sand between the grains. In the dry sand, they die out. You might find some of their, their uh, corpses or some of their exoskeletons in the dry sand. And the dry sand is even more sterile, but the wet sand, especially where the sand isn't moving too awful much, um, has a huge amount of life living, itty bitty life living between the grains of sand. Well, sand is pretty interesting. It moves around quite a bit. Um, and we don't like things that move around. Mm -hmm. We like things to be stay put. We don't like the sand blowing over our roads or blowing out from underneath our railroads or telegraph line. We don't like the sand blowing in the mouths of our streams and rivers. And so we went about changing that about 100 years ago. You're going to hear more about this um, in a couple of weeks. This is what the or much of the Oregon coast looks like now. This is the mouth of the Sayusla River. Uh, this is today's four dune. This is about 40 feet high thickly vegetated. And in the winter time, the storms eat at this edge, this ocean edge. Some people call that, and then you walk over, you go to the beach and you walk over the fore dune and then there's this jump. And you say, I'm not gonna go down there because I'm not sure I'll get back up. Um, then people call it a seawall, not a seawall, it's just the erosion of the fore dune. That's what it looks like today. This is what it's supposed to look like. This is a photograph um, of, a patch of remaining natural foredune on the Oregon coast. There's a little, there used to be a little bit of foredune hand maintained uh, by the um, National Park Service office near Oric. Uh, this is what it looked like. Instead of being 40 feet high, about five feet high. Instead of being thickly vegetated, it was lightly vegetated with lots of open space. Instead of being dominated by um, one species, um, primarily by one species. There's a wider variety of species. And this has now changed. The Oregon dunes grass that we introduced at the turn of the last century has done a number of things. One of the things that it does is done is it shades the, um, the, it shades the sand, it keeps it cool. If you've ever walked out to the beach and beach sand is hot, and the sand underneath the, the forward dune underneath the plants is cool and keeps it moist. So it's changed the habitat and allowed uh, other plants to come in that would not normally be there when it was dry. And so there are species of plants on the Oregon coast, such as pink sand verbena, that are at risk because uh, the, the dunes plants that we introduced to keep the sand from moving and do a dynamite job, um, unfortunately, um, have taken over and changed the habitat. The other thing that's happened um, is that this plant, these shrubs, uh, almost shrubs, they're fairly high, excuse me. These plants are, um, give, they're pretty, you know, they're up to your waist. 
and they're dense and they give a lot of habitat for animals as well. So this has developed a very uh, prominent area of protection for certain predators, oh, like especially crows and foxes that eat the eggs of uh, Western snowy plovers. And this is the primary reason that Western snowy plovers are at risk or are being threatened is because they've lost some of their habitat on the beach uh, with some of these plants. They can still find places to lay their eggs on the open sand near driftwood and such, but the crows and the foxes uh, can find them much more readily because they can hide in here until the adult is gone and take advantage. So it's been a really ma real major uh, problem for them as well as the plants. And the other thing that, that the Fordings have done is they built up so high here with that plant, with, with the European beach grasses, uh, the wind brings the sand in and gets caught in the plants and builds up. And the sand is trapped here coming off the, the shore instead of moving inland. And because it's trapped here, the uh, seasonal wetlands that used to be temporary and moving around are now permanent. And now instead of just plants to maybe some shrubs and baby trees, now we have places where there are 30 year old trees sucking a lot of water out of the um, aquifer underneath. Um, there are places where uh, the sand is, is just being decimated. It is, there are also places along the dunes where uh, that introduced beach grass is, is, is spreading and keeping the sand from moving. So the estimation is by some that within the next 50 to 100 years, all of the open sand, except for a few open places and for trails will be covered by that plant. It, it's already, you're already starting to see it. Historically, this is all open. Here's a tree island. This is at John Gellenbach area in the Umpqua Dunes. It's a tree island. This is a little wetland that is more permanent than it used to be. Um, this is the, the beach, the four dune, the deflation plain has, has a lot more vegetation than prehistorically. And these little hummocky areas uh, have plants on them now that didn't have them a hundred years ago. So we still have right now, go out and do, enjoy the dunes before they're gone uh, because they are changing. We like sand, right? We like to play in it. We take pictures of it. We like to sit on it. We, we um, enjoy the movement. We, we wait till they're gone to pick up the, the agates, perhaps. Um, we like watching the, the evidence of living things in the sand, um, looking at prints and such. Uh, so it's a pretty special thing, I think. And tonight we got to talk a little bit about the processes and some of the inhabitants, some of the situations uh, for living things that are centered around the special qualities of sand. Oops. So, got some questions and answers. We promise an hour program. How do, how do we do, Jesse? Do we do an hour? <sighs> Wow, we're uh, even under an hour, Marty. That was um, amazing. Well, we have a question. We have an excellent question from Stephanie. We do have an excellent question. Yes, and, uh, and let's let's let everybody else hear it in case everybody. I will. Can see it. The question is Stephanie's question is what creates squeaky sand beaches? So um, I'm gonna I'm, that's, that's I'm not gonna type in the answers. So I'm gonna talk about it because it's really really. Yes, easy. please. And if anyone else, by the way, has any questions, you may either raise your hand. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you can raise your hand and then I will unmute you and you can talk, which makes this a much more interactive experience for all of us. Um, so right before we answer Stephanie's question, you can also, you can type your question into chat or into Q&A. Cool, thank you. So um, uh, we're not entirely sure why sand makes noise, but this is the guess, okay? This is the, the guess last I checked and there might be new information. Uh, but if you look at sand, remember we talked about being rounded off and look at this piece of garnet, for example, it's nice and round. And this sand, here's a piece of, of feldspar that's nice and round. The sand that does a really good job of making noise, sometimes it makes noise on the beach when you stuff your feet, right? Uh, or in the dunes sometimes you can take the dry sand and, and, and run your hands together. Uh, I couldn't find my video, but I have a video. Makes that noise when you clap your hands together. Sometimes 
the sand to do that, two things have to happen. One is their grains have to be well-rounded to do that. If they're not well-rounded, they're gonna get caught on each other. And these quartz crystals aren't gonna squeak very well, but a combination of quartz and feldspar would squeak um, probably. You scuff your feet, you get, I think if I remember correctly, it's uh, D above middle C, C, D, uh, maybe, yeah. Uh, is one tone when you stuck your feet, right? It's a short little push. And on the beach, you can find one patch that's the right, apparently the right balance between being dry and having a little bit of just the right of moisture, right amount of moisture around the grains. If it's too dry, it won't do anything. If it's too wet, it won't do anything. Uh, how, if you've ever <laughs> taken a crystal glass, doing washing the dishes or something, I want to do some fun thing, and you get your finger wet or you get the rim wet and you go around the rim, the right speed goes, makes that, it winds, right? You can set up a vibration that you can hear. So it appears, and my understanding is that when the, the moisture is the right level and you scut them, then those, you can set up a whole set of vibrations that makes the sand do that, okay? It makes the squeaking. So you know about the squeaking on the beach, did you know that our dunes can moan? If you look up singing sands on the internet, look for you know, MP3 files or something, you can find uh, sands in the deserts that make noises. Uh, I think it was uh, Lawrence, of, uh, Lawrence of Arabia talked about these creepy eerie noises in the middle of the night in the dunes. We didn't know where it came from. Uh, when our dunes are dry enough, like an in August, but not when it's been foggy, are dry enough, you can go to the slip face of a dune, even if it's a small transverse dune, go to a slip face. And if you stick your hands in and it's dry like to this deep, about that deep or more, but it's dry that deep, take your hands and it's dry. You might be able to make the dunes moan. Put your hands up as high as you can on the dune, you know, put your feet on, you're on the bottom of the dune, high as you can, reach as high as you can, probably higher than I, than I can and drive your fingers into the sand and pull it down about as fast as you can and pull it down, but put your feet far apart so you can pull it down between your feet. And if the sand is the right balance of wet and dry, it'll go home, oh, about that loud. It'll go home, oh. it's really <laughs> interesting. And you can go down, if, you, if it's doing that, you can go down the slip face with your feet or on your butt and slide down the slip face and it will do that while you're going down the dunes. So it's a different pitch than the squeak, squeak, squeak on the beach. It'll Thank you. Thank you, Marty. That's a great answer. I know um, Stuart Schultz, who uh, wrote the book, The Northwest Coast, and who often will lead tours for us, he also has some theories about about the squeaking sand. And he has a theory about the North Coast versus the South Coast. It's very interesting. And I can't get into that right now, but okay. we can talk about that at a later date. And he will talk about that. It's okay, very that's interesting. Cool. And it, the sand is a little bit different and it, it really uh, great dependency on the current conditions. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. Yeah. You're yeah, welcome. So we have three more questions, but we also have a hand, a hand raised or we did I have a hand raised. Let's see if we have, if the person who raised her hand is still here. Tracy, I think it was Tracy. Did you want to ask a question still, Tracy? If so, I will, I've just allowed you to talk. I think that was you that raised your hand. Go ahead. You've been unmuted. Tracy's muted. Let's see. Uh, she typed in a question. Okay, well, we'll answer that. Yeah. What exactly is sea glass? Is it melded sand or actual glass eroded by sand? Okay, so I will confess. I, I, I do beach walks a lot. I've done a lot of beach walks, a lot of beach walks. And I often have people get all excited about beach glass. Oh, look at that, it's a beach glass. To me, it's glitter because beach mm -hmm. glass is uh, uh, human glass, it's our glass that's been rounded by the sand grains, by the process mm. that we talked about, rounded off, and given that frosty, it's not going to get really shiny. Uh, there are crystals and glass that are just really, really small, so it gets kind of frosty on the outside. Um, and and it, it is man-made, it's not a natural thing. Okay, thank you that's for your question. question. Tracy, okay. Um, 
Alethea asks, what is heavy black sand? Uh, it almost looks like oil. She must be talking about the, the magnetite. Is that right? Uh, magnetite, there's several different black minerals, depending upon what, what beach it is. Uh, if you're really in, I, if you can find this, this is really cool. This is a, um, right up there, right up this yep. is a lot of print that you can find. It's way cool. And they have a lot of information about uh, sand and sand communities on the Oregon coast. And they also have some profiles of sand and different beaches. And there are different percentages of uh, potassium sands and different sands that are, are magnetite and other things. It varies quite a bit from place to place. And I, I've often had, uh, many times had people say, oh, I saw an oil spill on the beach. And you go to the beach, especially on the central coast, you go to the beach, and there is a black stripe on the beach, just like that. But you go up to it and you touch it and it's just a place where the currents, both the tide and the wave, those processes have concentrated a stripe, a vertical, uh, horizontal stripe of black sand, of heavy sand. And it looks like oil because it's in a line and because it's dark, but if you go look at it, uh, you'll find it sand. Oil on the beach, um, uh, is almost, uh, unless it's a fresh spill, oil on the beach tends to gather up and, and make tar balls rather than stripes here anyway. And not to say there's never uh, uh, oil on the beach. But go and look, look at it. It's almost always um, dark sand, variety of dark, heavy minerals that have been sorted out by weight in a horizontal line. Thank you, Marty. Um, okay, we have three more questions. We're gonna to get to Jen and then Mary Jo, who's raised her hand and then to Rachel. So Jen uh, says, thank you for teaching us tonight. I've often seen that much of Southern Oregon coast sand is garnet. Why don't we find larger garnets on the beach? That's a great question. Great question. Because sand is not a thing. Sand is a size. So that it's the size of crystals of whatever minerals that got to the beach. So they're already all small, just some of them happen to be garnet. And so the, the garnets, uh, remember too, that the, most of the sand that is on the beach, uh, at least on the central coast and northern coast, much of that sand was from the prehistoric lower sea levels that mixed them all up. And that sand came from the coast range the sand in the coast range came from the Kalamaths. So again, the Kalamath Mountains were the sand grains were broken down, broken apart, the crystals were broken apart and small rocks and big rocks. They were sorted out as they went down to the ocean and the size that we call sand traveled the right distance to lay out on the floor of the ocean, north of what is now the Klamath Siskiyou Mountains, layer upon layer made sandstone, so the sand went to the beach one time, sorted out by size mostly, made another sandstone pushed up, worn down and broken apart again, sorted out by size, and then gone to the beach again. So we're getting it at least a second time, and maybe some cases a third time going to the beach. But again, each of those processes uh, tended to leave the larger grains up river, on the river, right. and the, the cobbles and those kinds of things. And the sand grain size, is a size that travels really well and got to the beach. So it's not that we have, you know, there's not like big garnets that are being broken apart. They're just all sorted out by that size before it even got here. Thank that you. Question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so if you wanna find some bigger garnets, garnets maybe go upstream, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. The, the garnets, the garnets, uh, the parent rock of the garnets don't have like giant garden garnets like you would find if you're going prospecting in other parts of North America. The garnets are, I think in the original, like in the Klamaths are small. Yeah, interesting. So. Okay. So Mary Jo, um, if you still have a question, I have allowed you uh, to talk. So I've asked you to unmute if you want to ask your question. She's still muted. Yeah, I've asked you to unmute so you can just unmute yourself if you wanna talk. Okay, well, we'll ask Rachel's question and then um, if you want to in the bottom of your screen, you can unmute yourself, but you can be next. All right, Rachel's question is, do you know if the International Society of Sand has any of those awesome beach sand guides still available for purchase? 
I believe they are not available. They were available only for that uh, for that event. And the only reason I got it is that my my friend was there, and he I said I asked if there were any proceedings because I was interested in that. And he I, I gave him the money, and, and he bought me proceedings. Um, and so that that I don't think any others are available. The uh, International Society of Fan Collectors has a website. And you might be able to find them. It's possible it's on the website. Um, if International Sand Collection Society, uh, and I'm looking for, uh, yeah, and the website name. Okay, everybody ready? Pencils, cup candy. I'll <laughs> put it in the chat. chat. Yeah, you put it, oh, good. Yeah, if you want to put it in the chat, uh, or I can do that in the chat. You want me to do it? You want to do it? I can do it. Okay, uh, www.sandcollectors.org. And they, they do have really cool photographs and some of them from, from this part of the world and from all over the world. It's just great. Yeah. That's super. Okay. So let's see, we've got, I'll take two more questions. Um, Mary Jo, are you still there? Okay. I'm going to go to Colleen. You have, um, you are allowed to talk now. Oops. Let's see, where did you go? Ask to unmute, okay. And they can also type their question into the question and answer block too, if they're having yeah. trouble, right? Is that right? Yeah, they can. So Colleen, you are unmuted now if you want to talk. No, I thought I heard someone's voice tonight, so I know that it's working. Hmm. Oh, are you there Colleen? Oops. I think I heard you. I'm here. Oh, yay. Okay, great. Am I, am I there? Yep, you're here. Yeah. We can hear you. Okay. Great. <laughs> okay. The, I, I'm interested in having the uh, title of the book uh, she showed. Um, oh, okay. And I don't remember the title, but it had, had too many words for me to remember. <laughs> I'll, type that in, I'll type that in into the chat. Uh, it is out of print, unfortunately. There's also oh no, uh, yeah, there's other volumes, uh, other kinds of things. Uh, and my this is my older copy. I've got a, I have a new copy as well. Uh, but if you are if you like plants too, and remember, sand and, and the dunes include the fact beach, right? The four dunes. And so uh, this is a, an ancient copy. There's a, again a newer edition. Plants of the Oregon Coastal Dunes. Oops, there we go. Mm -hmm. uh, by Wiedemann is a classic. And uh, besides having the plants in there, uh, he talks a little bit about basic processes, uh, but that's a, a plant guy with the sand thing. But this is, I will type this in. Uh, I hope that you can find it. I also, somebody gave me this. Um, this is an ancient book. Uh, he found it at a, a, um, a friend of mine gave this to me, oh, 10 years ago. Um, the Coastal Sand Dunes of Oregon and Washington by Cooper. And I haven't had a lot of time to uh, look at it, but it has some fold out pages, historic stuff. This was actually published, is it uh, in 19, let's get over here, uh, published in originally. And um, it's old enough, they don't have the publishing date on the back of the fly. Oh, I'm sorry, 58, 1958, Coastal Sand Dunes of Oregon and Washington in 1958. And, and so some of these, one. some of these might be available digitally online. So I would do, definitely do a Google search. Um, okay. So we actually, we're going to take two more questions because you're all still okay. here and it's really great. Is Jessica, that okay? Can I can I suggest, Jesse, do you have a, a way that we can type in the titles uh, and everything of these, at least three, these three do, uh, volumes uh, on the, the Coast Watch website or somehow make them available? Yes, yes, actually, yeah. Um, yes, we, we can do that. In fact, I can send, do we send a follow-up email to all of the attendees? And so we can put that, we can put that in there, Marty. Let's, let's do that. Um, yes. All right, so last two questions. Uh, first from Stephanie, and part of this was answered before, um, but where are the agates of the central coast coming from? The ancient offshore, offshore volcanoes or from inland flows? So it's my understanding 
that uh, I always have long answers. I'm sorry. It was my understanding that agates form because silica is is uh, if you put if you put water in a glass made of a drinking glass of silica, it's not going to dissolve the glass. But if you run the water through a volcano first and superheat it and change its pH, it will dissolve some <laughs> silica and then take it to a crack or a bubble or I saw once take it to the middle of a, a seashell and that silica can precipitate out and form the agate. It's also how geodes are formed. And so, yes, they form uh, around volcanoes, et cetera, because it has to get super hot. It can also, they can also form deep where uh, closer to the mantle, for example. And um, so, and they, they don't have to travel very, you know, if they travel too far, they're gonna cool off and make, you know, flat agates or agate seams, or they'll, they'll instead of, gelling um, uh, with teeny tiny crystals, it may gel slow enough that the crystals grow and we call it quartzite or something else, it'll look different. Um, and so the agates that we find on the Oregon coast um, started, remember we had that volcanoes, those, that range of volcanoes we call the, the uh, Oregon Cascades. And we have all those points of volcanics where, where melted uh, ocean bottom combined with melted, um, uh, continental rock came up cracks in the continent as we were moving and getting caught and twisting around be cracks in in the rock and that melted stuff would come up and could form some agates along there so the agates are forming in many different places as be my understanding as well as in the Kalamas because they started out as offshore volcanic islands also probably forming agates so that's that's what I'm thinking uh, is the source of our egg in a variety of places. Does, does that answer your question? You can't see people to see. What do you think, <laughs> Jesse? Did that answer the question? I think that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, well, so there's the, one of the very last questions actually brings brings us to a closing, which is great. And Stephanie says yes, thanks. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Um, so thank you everyone for being here tonight. And Marty, uh, thank you. May I, may I take just a minute to answer anonymous attendees question about- I'm, I'm going to do that. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually do that because we're gonna, we're, yeah. So I anonymous- I about covering it, Yeah. time issues, okay. Yeah, so anonymous attendee asks, is there an effort to take out invasive grasses? So there is, um, not so much in Oregon, but it is planned. In fact, there are, um, efforts uh, now um, in that direction. It's happening a lot more in California, but it will be happening in Oregon. And we will be discussing that in two weeks um, on October 25th at our next program, um, which will be uh, available for registration starting probably tomorrow, um, if not tomorrow by Monday. Um, Sally Hacker, um, Dr. Sally Hacker will be speaking to us. She's been in a number of our programs um, before uh, now. Um, and also joining her will be um, Ian Silvernail and a yet to be a determined guest as well, talking about the botany of the Oregon dunes, Oregon dune plants and restoration efforts um, in Oregon. So there are some uh, efforts to take out invasive grasses and also uh, plant, um, plant some uh, native uh, plants, but also some of the plants are self-seeding, but we're running a little bit late tonight, so we won't get into that, but we can talk about that next time. Yes. The other anonymous attendee or the earlier question is a legal question that I'd like to uh, I'd like to answer if that's okay. okay. Uh, and, and yes, it is illegal to bring sand samples over international boundaries, and um, I, I, I it, it's illegal because if you remember the the time we were talking about the myofauna, the light between the grains, it's illegal because there's a, a concern about introducing invasive species mm -hmm. in the sand grains. Uh, and, and yes, it is, it is illegal. I do not know, frankly, how uh, that group gets around that. It may be that they, they treat it, they, you know, they microwave it or so, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but you are correct, it is illegal. Um, I've had, I, I don't get to do much traveling, but I've had friends who I won't, talk, I won't uh, squeal on, bring me sand samples from other places. And at least one occasion, the, their sand sample was confiscated at, at customs. So you are correct. And for a legitimate reason, um, you know, when we have sand samples like, like, like behind me, 
and see all that my table covered up with that uh, sand samples. Uh, they're not likely to get loose, but there is a legitimate concern about invasive species because of the myofinal. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks, Marty. Thank you for that. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, Marty, do you want to type in your uh, email into the chat so people can I have will. that, please? I will. Um, and I will also type in mine in case some of you are new um, to our Coast Watch webinars, to our Oregon Shores webinars, and you would like more information, um, you can contact me. Um, like I said, uh, oh, and our, our website is oregonshores.org. You can check that out for our upcoming programs, including outdoor programs, educational programs, and community and citizen science projects, so. Uh, Jesse, you will have to share that because I only have chat capability with uh, with you and the, um, the panel. Okay, I'm gonna type it in right now. There we go, mgiles at wavecrestdiscoveries.com. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Marty. That was a wonderful program. This program has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel next week. Um, and keep an eye out for Marty, who will be hopefully joining us again, maybe in the spring and summer for another Coast Watch orientation or two. Thank yeah. you all for participating. Thanks for the invitation. And everybody have a good evening. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Marty. See you soon. Goodbye. Good night.